On the 10th of June 1996, 18-year-old Hu Gejie Le Tu was sentenced to death for the R-word and intentional homicide of a 25-year-old woman. The young man had been arrested only 62 days earlier and was taken immediately to his execution site, moments after the verdict had been announced. Protesting his innocence until the last moment, he was executed by gunshot to the head. One of the lead detectives on the case, Feng Juming, was widely praised for his swift work in taking a dangerous, violent killer off the streets and keeping the public safe. However, 10 years later a man named Zhao Zhihong stood in court awaiting to hear his sentence after being found guilty of multiple crimes. He had confessed to numerous intentional homicides, or words and robberies that had taken place over the previous decade. Moments before the judge handed him the expected death penalty, Zhao Zhihong questioned why one of the incidents he had confessed to wasn't put before the court. He told police that he violated a woman before ending her life in a public toilet 10 years ago. The case he was referring to was the same one Hu Ge Ji Le Tu had been executed for in 1996. The judge quickly adjourned the trial so the members of the media gathered could be removed from the courtroom. The sentencing resumed later that day and Zhao Zhihong was sentenced to death. He quickly lodged an appeal. A few days later on December 25th he wrote a letter of reparation claiming that during his time in custody he had regained his humanity, again claimed he was guilty of the April 9th case, and that he hoped the authorities would reopen and reinvestigate the case. Zhao Zhihong, who would become known as the smiling serial killer had been arrested just over a year ago after a series of violent attacks on women in the inner Mongolian cities of Wulan Chabu and Hu He Haute. On the 2nd of January 2005 in the city of Wulan Chabu, about 140 kilometers from Hu He Haute, the police received a call from a woman identified as Zhang Mou. The terrified and hysterical Zhang Mou reported that she had just been assaulted in the back of a taxi cab by the driver. Once police got her to the station she told them what had happened. She had been waiting for a bus into the city in the inner Mongolian freezing winter and heavy snow, when the cab pulled up alongside her to ask if she needed a lift. Wanting to get out of the bitter cold and traffic being slow on the roads, she decided to get in. A decision that almost ended her life. The driver smiling enthusiastically jumped out of the car to place her luggage in the trunk, while telling her to get inside and warm up. As he drove he talked in a warm friendly manner and told a few jokes. He even said he would give her a discount because she was a woman by herself. Zhang Mo didn't really say much on the journey, mostly half listening and just giving polite replies. However, the driver seemed happy doing most of the talking. That was until he drove off the road and into a wooded area. His smiling warm manner had vanished. Panicking, Zhang Mo shouted for the driver to stop the car. He did as asked then turned to face her with a knife in his hand. He climbed into the back and forced her to give him anything she had of value. He then assaulted her while holding the knife to her throat. After the attack was over, the driver got back behind the wheel and said he would take her to her destination. Terrified and traumatized, Zhang Mo begged for her life. The once again happy and smiling driver told her not to worry, she would soon be free. Not wanting to die at the hands of this man, Zhang Mo took an opportunity when the car slowed down at a sharp bend in the road. She used both her legs to kick the door open and jumped out of the car. Trying to get up quickly she watched the car, expecting the driver to come and get her. But he didn't stop, the taxi slowly drove away. It gave Zhang Mo enough time to memorize the vehicle's license plate. The police made a chilling discovery after checking the person the license plate number belonged to. The car was registered to a woman who was referred to as Chen Mo. Only that morning the body of Chen Mo had been discovered in a ditch in a field on the outskirts of the city. The taxi cab registered to Chen Mo and now the scene of two separate serious crimes was later found by police, but it would offer them no evidence. The smiling friendly killer driver had set it alight and left it to burn away any trace of himself or his crimes. With help from the surviving victim Zhang Mo, police produced an artist's impression of the man they were searching for, distributing it across the city and in newspapers, in the hope someone would identify the individual. Unfortunately, a response wouldn't come in time to save four more victims of the smiling serial killer Zhao Zhihong. Managing to get two victims only hours apart had made him see how useful pretending to be a taxi driver could be for his activities. He purchased a cheap minivan and cruised around the city looking for potential victims. Only five days after his brutal assaults on Zhang Mo and Chen Mo, police in Wulan Chabu had another body on their hands. A 24-year-old woman identified only as Gao Mo was convinced to get into the private taxi. 
before the arrival of the app Didi, the Chinese Uber. There were many people who made a living driving what were called heichu or black cars. For many people they were preferable to official taxis, as the price could be negotiated and agreed upon before getting in, whereas taxis would use a meter that could be tampered with and people didn't always trust. People were of course aware of the potential dangers of getting into an unlicensed car, but at rush hour when there were few real taxis free, public transport was overcrowded and unreliable. The private cars were a more convenient option. Zhao Zhihong drove Gao Mao outside the city, robbed her at knife point before choking her unconscious and assaulting her. He then pushed her out of the minivan and ended her life with the knife and dumped the body on the roadside. The cash and phone he took from her would only be worth the equivalent of 40 US dollars. The police found semen at the scene which matched with the samples collected from both Chen Mo and Zhang Mo. On the 22nd of February, Zhao Zhihong struck again. He spotted a 25-year-old woman identified as Zhang Mo Mo waiting for a bus outside Jining Railway Station in Wulan Chabu. Following the same pattern as the previous victim, he convinced her to get into his unlicensed taxi. He drove her to a quiet area of the Jining district and tied her up at knife point. He took 100 RMB, about $13 off her before violating her and taking her life with his knife. He then dumped the body in a shallow pit by the road. Once again semen samples were collected from the crime scene and seemed to match up with the previous violent attacks. Despite the police being no closer to tracking him down, there would be a seeming period of quiet over the following months. That was until the 13th of July 2005. This time the attack took place almost 240 kilometers outside Wulan Chabu in the rural county of Tuo Ke Tuo. Zhao Zhihong found a 12-year-old girl home alone in a small village. He forced his way into the home, knocking the young girl unconscious before violating her. This time, however, his victim would survive the attack. His next target, however, would not. Days later, in his home city of Hu He Haute, on the 20th of July, a 17-year-old woman identified as Yao Mo chose to get into his black car. Zhao Zhihong drove her to the Saihan district of the city. He robbed the girl of any money she was carrying, which was around $10, before choking the life out of her. This time when dumping the body at the roadside he did make some attempt to hide it by leaving it covered in a forest. The attacks over the previous months had largely taken place in Wulan Chabu and as such the police artist's impression of him hadn't been widely circulated outside of that city. This one took place in the city he lived and worked. With semen samples linking this crime with the ones that took place in Wulan Chabu, the police sketch would be seen by more people likely to recognize him. One individual after seeing the image in a local newspaper contacted the Hu He Haute police and said the drawing resembled a man he knew who was working as a handyman at a local kindergarten. He didn't know the man's name. He only knew that staff and students at the kindergarten called him Uncle Hong. Police went through the employee data at the school and found the name Zhao Zhihong. They discovered he had been previously convicted of theft and imprisoned. Due to his time in jail they had a record of his fingerprints which they were able to check against prints they managed to find on some of his victims over the past months. With the fingerprints coming up as a match, the police went to the kindergarten and arrested Zhao Zhihong. He remained calm and emotionless as police took him away. Colleagues at the kindergarten, including a teacher he was having a romantic relationship with were stunned, thinking that the arrest was a mistake. They couldn't believe the friendly, smiling Uncle Hong could possibly be guilty of any crimes. In custody, Zhao Zhihong held nothing back. He freely confessed to numerous violent crimes over the preceding decade. He brought up cases that had never been reported by women he allowed to survive. Some of his victims didn't report the assaults, either out of shame or thinking the police wouldn't believe them. He confessed to 21 incidents, 10 of which were intentional homicides. However, one crime he confessed to, and claimed it was the first time he ever assaulted and ended the life of a woman was an incident that, in the eyes of the police had already been solved. The guilty party had been executed for the crime nine years ago, and it had long been forgotten, at least by most people in China. Born on the 5th of September 1972 on the outskirts of Hu He Haute, in the county of Liangcheng, Zhao Zhihong was the middle child of the family with an older brother and younger sister. He grew up in reasonable conditions for the time. While his parents certainly weren't wealthy, they were not farmers and so didn't experience extreme poverty that many others did. However, he was something of an underdeveloped child who seemed small for his age. Due to this he started primary school late, 
beginning his education at nine years of age. He had a close relationship with his father, but felt his mother was often indifferent to him, preferring his older brother and younger sister. It gave the young Zhao Zhihong the impression that he wasn't wanted. It would also create a feeling of abandonment and a resentment towards women he would carry with him throughout his life. After his brother was born, his mother wanted a girl. Zhao Zhihong believed he was just a disappointing mistake. Stuck in between two favorite children, Zhao Zhihong was largely ignored. While not a terrible student despite his late start, he showed little interest in learning and didn't care about his education. He did, however, develop something of a charming, friendly personality. People who knew him described him as a person who was easy to talk to and get along with. He was also a keen reader but didn't consume the same type of material of other males. He told police he enjoyed reading publications like Ji Yin, Du Zhe, and Hun Yin Yu Jia Ting, which were periodicals aimed at a female audience. On leaving education after junior high, with no qualifications, he worked alongside his father. Largely on construction sites learning some basic skills but mostly doing low-level jobs. Over the next few years, he moved around a lot finding work in different provinces and cities in the region. Then in 1995 his parents who were concerned that, at the age of 23, he still wasn't married, introduced him to a woman from a neighboring village. The pair were sent on a blind date and registered their marriage only the following day. However, problems between them would soon begin to emerge. Despite Zhao Zhihong having a less than impressive educational background, he considered his wife beneath him. She was illiterate while he was a keen reader and so he felt that they were not intellectually suited, that a bigger issue reared its head. People in China would often have a traditional, even puritanical view of women. It was expected that the bride be a virgin for her husband, although men were rarely held to the same standard of chastity. His new wife admitted that she'd previously been married and already had children from that marriage, while he hid his true feelings towards this, it made him want to divorce her but he didn't want to initiate the proceedings. He considered his wife's second-hand goods and started to believe that other people in the village were laughing and mocking his relationship behind his back. However, his supposed disgust at his wife not being a virgin for him didn't stop him from having his own child with her. After his wife told him she was pregnant he would doubt if the child was truly his. He would claim that his feelings towards what he viewed as his humiliation built up an anger in him and he went out looking for ways to vent it. 1996, the year after he was married would be when his criminal activity began. And it would be on the 9th of April 1996 that the lives of Zhao Zhihong and Hu Ge Ji Le Tu would faithfully cross in the city of Hu He Hao Te. Born on the 9th of August 1977, the middle child of three brothers, Hu Ge Ji Le Tu was born, raised and working in Hu He Hao Te, the capital city of Inner Mongolia. Up to this point the young man's life had been fairly unremarkable. At 18 years old, he was an employee at a large cigarette factory in the city and lived in dormitory accommodation provided by the company. The young man, who had never been in trouble with the police before, would make a decision that would have a dramatic and tragic effect on his life. In the evening of April 9th, Hu Ge Ji Le Tu, with his friend and colleague Yan Feng had just eaten together before heading to the cigarette factory to start their night shift. As they made their way to the factory gates, Hu Ge Ji Le Tu realized he had forgotten the key to his dormitory room. He told Yan Feng he was going back to get it, so Yan Feng said he would wait at the gate for him. As he walked back to the factory, Hu Ge Ji Le Tu thought he heard the sound of a woman calling for help from inside a public toilet he often passed when going to work. On getting back to Yan Feng, Hu Ge Ji Le Tu told him what he thought he'd heard. The two agreed to go investigate. But on reaching the toilet they heard nothing. Hu Ge Ji Le Tu said they should go and to check everything was okay. Yan Feng was hesitant, with good reason. The country was having a crackdown on crime, and two men entering a women's toilet could lead to them being arrested for the wide-ranging charge of hooliganism. Campaigns like the 1996 Yan Da would see people given the maximum punishments for any crime that could be considered as hooliganism. Two men going into a women's toilet could easily fall under that definition. Hu Ge Ji Le Tu was certain he had heard something and walked inside. Yan Feng followed his friend. It was evening, dark and the toilet had no lights. Unable to see anything in the darkness they called out but got no response. Yan Feng took out his cigarette lighter to brighten the dark room. It was then, they saw the half-naked body of a woman lying on a low wall. 
the shocked and scared young men quickly ran out of the toilet. Once outside, the duo discussed what they should do next. Yan Feng didn't want to get involved, he said they should just head to work. Someone else would enter the toilet, see the woman lying there and report it. In the panic caused by what they saw neither man checked to see if the woman was still alive. Hu Ge Ji Le Tu felt if there was a chance to save the woman's life they had to report it. Yan Feng knew he wouldn't be able to change his friend's mind, so they both went to a nearby security booth to report their finding. The victim was quickly identified and is referred to as Yang Mo Mo, recently engaged to be married, she was working at a nearby hotel. She had left the hotel only minutes earlier to make use of the toilet. She'd been brutally unworded and suffocated to death. Her body hidden behind the partitioning wall. The police in Hu He Hao Te now had a major case, and with the government-mandated crime crackdown would be under pressure to find the perpetrator quickly. An investigation team was put together, and headed up by the deputy director of the city's district of Xincheng Public Security Bureau, Feng Zhiming. Originally a member of the fire brigade, Feng Zhiming joined the police force in 1981. By 1996 he had risen up the ranks, and achieved the position of captain in the district's police force. Over the years he built himself a reputation as something of an iron fist when it came to dealing with criminals, and getting them to confess to their crimes. In 1998 he was involved in the death of a suspect he was interrogating. The official cause of death of the man in custody was accidental electrocution. Though there is little information on how a man, no doubt handcuffed to a table in an interrogation room could have achieved such a feat accidentally. Following the incident, Feng Zhiming would be removed from his position. He got much lower level work in the police for the next few years, but by 1996 he had managed to gain a more powerful position than he held previously. Now he was heading up the biggest criminal investigation in the city, under pressure from his superiors to get a result. After reporting their discovery of the woman in the toilet, Hu Ge Ji Le Tu and Yan Feng were taken to the local police station later that evening. And Feng Zhiming decided that he would personally interview Hu Ge Ji Le Tu. The witness interviews would quickly transform into an interrogation. Yan Feng had people who had seen him in the area at the time of the assault on Yang Mo Mo. However, during the time he went back to retrieve his key, Hu Ge Ji Le Tu didn't have anyone to confirm that they saw him. They were questioned all night. The officers interrogating Yan Feng focused on asking him about the personality and habits of Hu Ge Ji Le Tu. He was asked over and over if his friend enjoyed watching pornographic movies, or ever peeped on women in toilets. He was asked if his friend was a violent person or had a short fuse. Yan Feng responded that, as far as he knew, Hu Ge Ji Le Tu was just a regular, everyday guy. Then at some point Yan Feng began hearing screams of pain from the interview room next door. He recognized the sounds from the room as coming from his friend. Yan Feng was released early the next morning. As he was leaving he saw into the room where Hu Ge Ji Le Tu was still being questioned. He saw his friend being forced to squat against the room's heater, his hands handcuffed behind his back, and his face heavily bruised. Rather than going back home, Yan Feng went to see the parents of Hu Ge Ji Le Tu to tell them their son had been arrested and was still being held at the police station. His parents rushed to the Public Security Bureau and asked to see their son. They were told it wasn't possible, he had confessed to the R-word and intentional homicide of a young woman, and was being taken to the detention center. Hu Ge Ji Le Tu wouldn't actually confess until the following day, and faced another 24 hours of interrogation. Nine years later Zhao Zhihong, having confessed to the same crime was taken out by police to identify the scene of the crime. He had already accurately described how Yang Mo Mo had her life ended, but police wanted more. The public toilet had been demolished only two years after the incident, and in the intervening years there had been many changes to the area. Despite this, Zhao Zhihong was able to take police to the place Yang Mo Mo died with no issues. On April 11, 1996, after two days of interrogation, Hu Ge Ji Le Tu confessed to the R-word and intentional homicide of Yang Mo Mo. News of the confession was made public on the 20th of April. Feng Zhiming gave an interview to a newspaper going through how he had managed to get the dangerous violent criminal to confess. The case was treated as a shining example of police work in the face of the 1996 strike hard campaign against crime. And Feng Zhiming would be rewarded publicly for his efforts in quickly solving the case and keeping streets safe for women in the city. 
On May 7th, Hu Gejie Le Tu met with prosecutors before his trial. The young man who had never had any legal issues before naively believed that these were perhaps people who would help him. He retracted his confession and told them that he had been beaten, tortured, and not allowed to leave the room to use the toilet for two days. He also said he had been told the woman in the toilet hadn't died so if he confessed he wouldn't be in that much trouble. The prosecutors told him he was talking nonsense, he had confessed, ergo he was guilty. In the past, with investigation techniques still in the dark ages and forensics virtually non-existent, in Chinese criminal investigations confessions were king. On the 17th of May, Hu Ge Ji Le Tu was found guilty of R word and intentional homicide. He was sentenced to death. Only two days after the young man received his sentence, on the 19th of May Zhao Zhihong committed his next crime. He entered the room of a woman identified as Chi Mo Mo and violated her at knife point. Chi Mo Mo fought back against him, screaming for help. Zhao Zhihong stabbed her several times to try and silence her, but she survived the attack. Hu Ge Ji Le Tu had appealed his sentence, but with no one, including his own defense lawyers willing to listen to his accusations that the confession was beaten out of him, the appeal was rejected on June 5th. A show trial for the public was held on June 10th. The death sentence given to Hu Ge Ji Le Tu was upheld. There was no more time for further appeals. He was taken out of the courtroom and to the site of his execution. In shock, he could barely speak as he tried to protest. As his parents fought against the guards to enter the execution site, 18-year-old Hu Ge Ji Le Tu was executed via gunshot to the head. Unusually, after receiving the body, his older brother noticed there were two bullet holes, one to the temple and one to the back of the head. Only a month later, Zhao Zhihong would strike again. This time the victim was only 15 years old. He ended the life of the girl identified as Xu Mo Mo on a quiet dirt road and violated her post-mortem. The following month while walking past a factory in the city he spotted a man and woman engaged in some adult activity in a field by the factory. He stayed to watch and waited for the man to leave. Despite his alleged dislike for his wife not being a chaste woman, he didn't hold other women to the same standard. He approached the woman, identified as Song Mo Mo, and threatened to expose what he had seen her doing. He then forcibly violated her in the same place. The 22-year-old never reported the assault, as she would have had to tell police what she was doing before the attack. What happened with Hu Ge Ji Le Tu had emboldened Zhao Zhihong. He believed he was outsmarting the police and that they would never catch him. On the 5th of September, his birthday, Zhao Zhihong found another victim. He walked into the Weybridge room of a factory and attacked 29-year-old employee Wang Mo Mo with his knife ending her life. He then assaulted her corpse. By now Zhao Zhihong felt a compulsion to commit his crimes. He would later say whenever he was in a bad mood he would go out looking for a victim. It had become an addiction to him, and any negative thoughts or feelings of depression would disappear. His final victim in 1996 was allowed to live, but the assault would not be reported to the police. In late winter of that year Zhao Zhihong walked into a barber shop being run by the 22-year-old Hou Mo. She was forcibly violated at knife point and had any money she had taken, but there was no attempt to end her life. There would be almost a year until he struck again. During this time he was still married and engaged in an affair with a kindergarten teacher. However, he claimed to have fallen in love with another teacher at the same school. He didn't dare act on his feelings, which he claimed made him irritable and angry. He had also added petty theft to his list of crimes, but that wasn't enough to vent his feelings of anger. In the morning of September 6, 1998, he would release his anger. He broke into the home of a 22-year-old woman referred to as Yin Mo who was at home with her children at the time. Zhao Zhihong told the woman he would harm her children if she didn't let him do what he wanted. He assaulted the terrified woman, but allowed her and her children to survive the ordeal. Two months later he entered another home, but this time no one was hurt. However Zhao Zhihong did find 2,000 RMB, close to 300 US dollars today, hidden in a closet which he took. There would then be another gap in his criminal activity. It wouldn't be until January 31, 1999 that he would resume. Again he forced his way into someone's home. 
This time the victim was a 27-year-old woman identified as Wang Mo. On breaking in, Zhao Zhihong physically beat the woman, then made it clear he would end her life if she didn't submit to his desires. Getting what he wanted, Zhao Zhihong left the scene, allowing Wang Mo to live. The next victim wouldn't be so fortunate. In the evening of March 25th, he assaulted and ended the life of 23-year-old Gao Mo. After he was done, he searched the room looking for anything of value he could steal. However, he could only find 100 RMB, 13 US dollars today, and left the scene. On the 29th of June 1999, he forced his way into the home of a 17-year-old woman identified as Dong Mo Mo. He took her life and violated her before searching the home for cash or something else of value. He was unable to find anything worth taking and left the home. There would then be another significant gap until the next time he was criminally active. Around this time he would inform his wife of the affair he had been having with a kindergarten teacher. His wife left with their child and he soon got his wish of a divorce. Despite being the one who wanted the marriage to end, he didn't want to initiate the proceedings. His family had paid the woman's family a dowry for the marriage to go ahead. If his wife was the one to ask for the divorce, her family were expected to pay the money back for the failure of the marriage. However, Zhao Zhihong continued to send his now ex-wife and child what money he could afford to support them. In March of the year 2000, Zhao Zhihong would become active once more. On March 4th, he forced his way into the home of the Guo family with the intent to steal whatever he could find of value. He would leave with just under 1,000 RMB. The family were not at home at the time of the invasion so no one was hurt in the incident. 20 days later, he knocked on the door of a 29-year-old woman referred to as Wang Mo Mo. Using his smiling friendly persona, he asked the woman if it was possible he could get a cup of hot water from her. The woman didn't perceive any threat and got him the water. He then beat and bound her before violating her. He ransacked the woman's home looking for something to steal, but would leave the home empty-handed. Then on May 20th, Zhao Zhihong committed what was his most shocking and brutal crime. Using the same technique as his last assault, he knocked on the door of a home to ask for a cup of hot water. The door was opened by Su Mo Mo, she was just 10 years old. The young girl wasn't as trusting as the previous victim, so Zhao Zhihong forced his way into the home knocking the child to the floor. He then violated her before putting her into the home's water tank, leaving the 10-year-old to drown in the dark. He didn't look for anything to steal after, leaving the scene as quickly as possible. He followed that with another attempt to assault a child. This time the girl was only 11 years old. On the 23rd of September, Zhao Zhihong entered the home of the Xue family, looking for items or cash to steal. He found the young girl, identified as Xue Mo Mo, and attempted to assault her. Fortunately, the girl's older sister managed to interrupt Zhao Zhihong before he could violate her baby sister. On being disturbed, Zhao Zhihong beat the older sister to the ground before quickly fleeing the scene. There would then be another period of quiet from Zhao Zhihong, although some of that would be enforced upon him. In October of 2003, he was arrested for theft and sentenced to serve six months in prison. However, he was released early in December of the same year. After being released, it wouldn't be until he got into the taxi of Chen Mo on January 2, 2005, that he would resume his deadly addiction. After hearing the confession, the police had a job on their hands. While the 2005 crime spree had fingerprints and forensic evidence to support the confession, proving for certain that Zhao Zhihong committed the older crimes would prove to be more difficult. In China in the 1990s, police investigation techniques were very much in the dark ages in comparison with developed countries, and this was especially true outside of the major cities. Computerized databases were rare, fingerprint identification and comparison would have to be done with the naked eye. DNA analysis barely existed, and there was often little communication between police forces in different cities and even smaller towns. This combined with some of his attacks going unreported, Zhao Zhihong committing his crimes in different ways, and the age range of the victims meant that police hadn't connected any of the incidents. When police started to investigate older incidents Zhao Zhihong had confessed to, they found that, in many cases, forensic evidence, such as the semen samples and fingerprints had been lost or destroyed. All they had to connect him to the crimes were his own confessions. However, in some of the cases they found that there were a number of discrepancies. For example, in the case of 15-year-old Xu Mo Mo, while the basic details such as cause of death and the area were correct, there were contradictions with other elements. Zhao Zhihong got the specific time incorrect, 
Details about damage to the victim's bicycle were wrong, and footsteps found at the scene didn't match with the gator Zhao Zhihong. In the 1999 case of Gao Momo, again the basic details of the crime were correct. However, he would get details about the specific location of the corpse and the condition it was left in wrong, which left police with a weak confession. Of the crimes that went unreported, the victims would confirm that their attacker had been Zhao Zhihong. Of the 10 intentional homicides he confessed to, he would be found guilty in six cases. It was felt there wasn't enough conclusive evidence in three other cases, and of course the April 9th case wasn't put before the judges. The six intentional homicides were the September 5, 1996 case of Wang Momo, the May 20, year 2000 case of 10-year-old Si Momo, the January 2, 2005 case of taxi driver Chen Mo, the January 7, 2005 case of Gao Mo, the February 22, 2005 case of Zhang Momo, and the July 20, 2005 case of Yao Mo. These six cases were all considered solid cases against Zhao Zhihong, with no doubt about his guilt. It didn't seem to be a coincidence that, since Zhao Zhihong confessed to a crime where the supposed guilty party was executed on the strength of a confession alone, the prosecutors were now not prepared to convict him based off his own confessions, if there was no physical evidence to support them. The parents of Hu Ge Ji Le Tu, Shang Ai Yun, and Li San Ren only found out about the confession by Zhao Zhihong through gossip. People had seen police take him to the site of the April 9th crime scene, and rumors over what it was about spread. Once it was confirmed that Zhao Zhihong had indeed confessed to the crime their son was convicted of, they went looking for help to get the case investigated. However, it was difficult to find a lawyer prepared to take on the obvious challenges the case presented. One lawyer suggested they speak to journalist and head of the politics and culture department of the Xinhua News Agency of Inner Mongolia, Tang Ji. Xinhua is China's main state news agency for both domestic and international news. Tang Ji agreed to help the parents and began to publish a number of stories covering the case to pressure the police into investigating the case properly. The senior journalist had an excellent reputation as an investigative reporter and had recently exposed a massive fraud in the Wang Mujiang, or King Carpenter case. A businessman from Hong Kong by the name of Zheng Ze had come to the city of Hu He Hao Te with the promise of constructing the tallest building in the northwest. He was prepared to invest over 5 billion RMB into the project. In response, the local government began to demolish a number of buildings on the proposed site to make room. These included older hospitals, schools, and a recently built police station, as the city government promised the man from Hong Kong 50 acres of land in one of the prime areas of the city. When the company Zheng Ze claimed to represent was looked into, it was found to be a three-no company. In China, three no's refers to a company that is registered in Hong Kong but has no premises, no staff, and no capital. Further investigation showed that Hong Kong businessman Zheng Ze was actually Wang Xiniu from China's Hubei province. He had left education after primary school and had become a carpenter. In Chinese, the character Wang can mean king, so villagers who knew Wang Xiniu referred to him as King Carpenter. King Carpenter also went under five other identities, each with a company registered in Hong Kong and each had a different wife, four of whom had his children. It was discovered that he had committed a number of frauds and been able to earn close to 2 billion RMB. King Carpenter would be sentenced to life in prison after being exposed. After his reporting helped expose the massive fraud, Tang Ji was now tackling another major story. With a respected and well-connected journalist now looking into the case, police and legal bodies were nervous. Tang Ji reached out to sources he had good relationships with, and while some were not keen on speaking to him, others confirmed that it looked like the wrong man had been executed for the April 9th case. He would also secretly be handed a copy of the letter Zhao Zhihong had written in the days after his sentencing, something the judiciary had tried to keep quiet. The attention Tang Ji would bring to the case meant that a cover-up was pretty much impossible. One man who was undoubtedly nervous about the confession Zhao Zhihong made in custody was now the deputy director of the Saihan district of Hu He Hao Te Public Security Bureau, and the person who obtained the confession from Hu Ge Ji Le Tu, Feng Zhiming. The year after he got a confession out of Hu Ge Ji Le Tu, he was made head of the anti-narcotics department of the district's police. He had then continued to rise up the ranks and take increasingly more powerful positions. Feng Zhiming would visit Zhao Zhihong in custody on four occasions to interview him extrajudicially. He claimed he was looking for discrepancies in the confessions Zhao Zhihong gave, and was certain that Hu Ge Ji Le Tu was the guilty man. 
Once the illegal interrogations were exposed, Zhao Zhihong was moved to a different detention center under armed military guard. With help from Tang Ji, the parents of Hu Gejie Le Tu got the case reopened, hoping to get justice for their son. However, it would be a long process. With the new investigation techniques now available, the first point of call was to go over the physical evidence recovered at the scene. Reports made at the time stated that fingerprints and semen samples were found. These could now be checked and tested against the fingerprints of Zhao Zhihong and his semen samples from the 2005 crime spree. The only physical evidence actually used at the time to link Hu Gejie Le Tu to the crime was blood, supposedly found in small cracks in his fingernails. Those reported to have come from scratches on the head of Yang Mo Mo. The blood was type O, which matched with the victim's blood type, but is also the most common blood type worldwide. However, when investigators asked to see the evidence so it could be put through the modern tests, they were told that it had been lost. It wasn't uncommon for evidence like this to go missing as China developed and police forces moved to more modern facilities, but this seemed a little too coincidental. The only option left to investigators was to go over the confessions of both Hu Gejie Le Tu and Zhao Zhihong. Hu Gejie Le Tu made a number of confessions during his two-day interrogation, each new one contradicting the last. But the accusations of torture and beatings called them all into question. So that left the confession of Zhao Zhihong, which many were already skeptical of. There was a feeling that Zhao Zhihong was trying to buy himself more life by confessing. He knew that the authorities wouldn't be able to execute him while the case was being investigated, and that was why he made sure to bring it up during his sentencing. There were discrepancies in his confession, as there were other incidents he confessed to. He couldn't be specific about the time of the assault and made errors in what clothes the victim, Yang Mo Mo, was wearing at the time being the most notable. His being able to remember the location of the public toilet after it had been demolished wasn't viewed as particularly compelling by investigators. Zhao Zhihong had been working in the area at the time, and it was likely he would have been familiar with the location. His knowing the cause of death could just have been because he remembered it from news reports at the time of the crime happening. According to his confession, he had an argument with his wife and went out looking for some way to vent his anger. He saw Yang Mo Mo leave the hotel, and finding her attractive followed her. When she went into the dark toilet he continued following. Inside he started choking her and violated her as he did so. The investigation reached a deadlock which would drag on for a number of years. Tang Ji continued to write about the case and would promote what he saw as a massive miscarriage of justice. He would even organize a TV show to promote his cause nationwide. The continued efforts of Tang Ji and a change in the leadership of Inner Mongolia's Supreme Court finally saw some progress in the case. In March of 2014, a new legal team looked into the case once more. In December 2014, eight years after Zhao Zhihong stated he was the guilty party in the April 9th case, a verdict would finally be announced. The original judgment was revoked and Hu Gejie Le Tu was acquitted. Members of the local government and Supreme Court personally handed the verdict to Shang Ai Yun and Li Sanren in their home, apologizing in front of a large gathering of the national media. Zhao Zhihong wouldn't be charged with the crime. Investigators, no doubt with Hu Gejie Le Tu, in mind decided that there just wasn't enough evidence to conclusively say he was the perpetrator. With the acquittal of Hu Gejie Le Tu and Zhao Zhihong only being considered as the most likely suspect, the death of Yang Mo Mo technically remains an unsolved case to this day. Two days after the announcement of the acquittal, Feng Zhiming was arrested. He was facing a number of charges including embezzlement, dereliction of duty, accepting bribes and extorting confessions with torture. Officially, the arrest was unrelated to the Hu Gejie Le Tu case, but the timing of it did appear to be remarkably coincidental. After a two-year investigation, on the 18th of October 2016, Feng Zhiming was found guilty of accepting close to 4 million RMB in bribes, over half a million US dollars today. Having close to 5 million US dollars worth of unexplained assets and the illegal possession of four firearms, he was sentenced to 18 years in prison. There would be a further 26 people punished for their role in the conviction of Hu Gejie Le Tu. Those included members of the judiciary, police and local government, however their punishments were largely demotions from their positions. Another senior member of the Xincheng branch of the Hu He Hao Te police who was part of the investigation, would find himself the target of a criminal investigation in 2019. Liu Xu was being investigated over accusations of criminal activity in the past. 
After being asked to appear before a disciplinary committee, the former police captain disappeared. His body was found three days later hanging from a tree in a forest on the outskirts of Hu He Hao Te, having chosen to end his own life. The journalist who did so much to help investigate the case and bring it to the attention of the public, Tang Ji, would be given numerous awards for his work. He continued his journalistic career going on to expose many other incidents of corruption in Hu He Hao Te. Zhao Zhihong, originally sentenced to death in 2006, had been held in detention for nine years as his confession to the April 9th case was investigated. Once Hu Ge Ji Le Tu was acquitted for the crime he confessed to, Zhao Zhihong appealed his death sentence. He believed he should be shown some leniency for his help in exposing a massive miscarriage of justice, and that he had been re-educated and regained his humanity while imprisoned. His appeal was rejected, and the original sentence was upheld for six cases of intentional homicide, 12 R-words, several of which were committed against minors, and the numerous robberies. However, it would be a further four years until the sentence was carried out. After 13 years of extra life, Zhao Zhihong would finally receive his punishment, and on the 30th of July 2019, he was executed for his decade-long crime spree. After the sentence was carried out, his family refused to accept his remains. The family of Hu Ge Ji Le Tu always believed that their son and brother was innocent of the crimes he was convicted of and executed for. Over the years their suffering didn't stop at unjustly losing a family member. The stigma of having a son executed for our word and intentional homicide followed the parents for years. They had to retire early from their work as they faced endless gossip, innuendos and mistreatment from their employers and colleagues. This left their oldest son as provider of the family. The younger brother of Hu Ge Ji Le Tu, once a promising student gave up on education due to the relentless bullying he received at school. All members of the family lost friends who didn't want to be associated with a violent criminal's family. They would be given 2 million RMB, 279,000 US dollars today, in state compensation, and would be reimbursed for the numerous expenses they accrued over the years spent trying to get justice for Hu Ge Ji Le Tu. On November 11, 2015, Shang Ai Yun and Yi San Ren were able to move their son's ashes from a small nondescript plot of land to a new specially designed tomb. From the air, the tomb is supposed to resemble a teardrop or question mark, both fitting symbols for the Hu Ge Ji Le Tu case. An epitaph for the stone was penned by Jiang Ping, the former president of the China University of Political Science and Law. Parts of the inscription read, when Hu Ge Ji Le Tu was 18 years old he died unjustly. His life was short and tragic. It is a warning to those who hold judicial authority that they should value evidence, not make assumptions, not abuse power or abandon the rule of law and justice. Words that came too late for Hu Ge Ji Le Tu and many other women and children, as Zhao Zhihong was free to destroy the lives of his many victims and their families. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a like, leaving a comment, and subscribing to the channel and hope to see you again for the next Dark Tale from the Middle Kingdom.